Are you keen to make bourbon at home? You're in luck, because I have a fantastic recipe, and the best part is, it's pretty much fail safe. How's it going chasers? I hope you're having a kick ass week. I'm Jesse, this is Still It, and I am guessing that there is a bunch of you that are wanting to make your own bourbon at home. And maybe you've tried it before and it didn't work out quite the way you wanted it to. Uh, maybe you've done the sugar and essence thing and that wasn't quite what you were expecting or hoping for. Uh, perhaps the idea of getting stuck into a all grain mash is just a little bit, it's a little bit daunting to you. I get it, trust me. We're all new at some point in time and this hobby has a insane learning curve. I think this is the best recipe I've ever made. It's gonna dip your toes in the water of all grain. It's gonna give you all of those benefits, but you don't have to stress about it because we've got the safety net of sugar. I get it, I know sugar's a compromise, but in this case, I think it's worth it and we're gonna combat all of the downsides as best we can. Let's talk about equipment real quick. Uh, and spoiler alert, it's not that scary for this stuff. The point of this recipe is to be easy for new people to the hobby. So you're gonna need a brew and a bag bag. This is what happens. <laughs> when you don't clean it. Don't be like me, clean your sack, all right? <laughs> uh, you're gonna need a pot, a large pot. If you have a stock pot or something similar, that is perfect. Uh, if you don't have a dirty great big pot, then uh, multiple pots, or you can batch things, that's not gonna be a problem. Something to heat said pot with. You're going to need uh, something ideally to measure ABV or proof. This is a refractometer specifically used for testing uh, ABV or proof. You can of course use an alchemeter, uh, like the hydrometer kind of jobbies. Uh, either is good, and to be honest you don't absolutely need one. You're also going to need a still. This needs a clean, but it's also the Still Spirits boiler uh, with the Still Spirits copper alembic dome. Any still that is roughly this size with a large mouth at the top uh, that can operate in a pot still configuration will work. And lastly, you're going to need a fermenter. I'm using a dirty great big 120 litre fermenter. You don't necessarily need one that big, you can just use 20 litre buckets if you want to, uh, but you're going to need enough space for 80 litres of liquid with a decent amount of head space on each of those. There's going to be more experienced brewers and distillers watching this saying, why don't you just use a insert piece of equipment here. Completely agree. If you have the means to do that and the experience to use it, definitely. Just remember the point of this recipe is to draw people into the world of all grain. Uh, it's a bit of a compromise, I get that. But the point is to just get people started with a pretty solid result, I gotta say. Anyway, uh, the, the next thing is to, to start talking about the mash. So let's talk mash ingredients. First of all, corn. We're gonna be using good old fashioned cracked corn. It's bourbon, bourbon there has to be corn in it, okay? Simple enough. Uh, you could, of course, use torrefied, flaked, uh, any of the cooked corn varieties, malted corn, um, and that would allow you to skip the boiling the corn stage. If you wanna do so, go right ahead, uh, but I'm using 4.7 kilos of cracked corn. By the way, Freedom Units will be popping up all over the place as I talk in metric. We do, of course, need enzymes to convert the starch into sugar, so 3.25 kilograms of distiller's malt, 2.75 for the mash, and we're reserving a little bit for, uh, you'll see. <laughs> Next up, wheat. A bunch of bourbons have wheat in it, it's not something crazy or different. Uh, it's a standard bourbon ingredient, but for this one, I would suggest using a cooked wheat, so torrefied wheat, flaked wheat, flecked wheat, any of the wheats that have already been gelatinized for you. I'm using 500 grams or half a kilo of this stuff. But remember, we're gonna be using sugar. And technically that's, well, it's just straight up not good in terms of flavor at the end. It's a compromise, so we wanna crowbar in as much flavor and complexity as we can from the beginning. Enter. Oh, <laughs> shepherd's delight. This stuff provides a really amazing, rich, caramelly flavor that bleeds over into uh, like dark fruit, pruny kind of things almost, which is very, very similar in my mind to some of the flavors that you'll pick up in a really well-aged bourbon. So we're gonna use half a kilo, 500 grams of this stuff. And lastly, 175 grams of light chocolate malt. This stuff's gonna give 
funnily enough, like milk chocolate kind of vibes, chocolate milky kind of vibes, and some more kind of grungy flavors as well, heading towards coffee, a touch of burnt toast, but mixed with all the other sweetness we've put in here, that's gonna come across kind of like sweet chocolatey espresso, which once again, is uh, flavors that I appreciate in a well-maturated bourbon. Hey, do you want some uh, trippy astronaut art? No? All right. Hmm? This? This? What about wax stuff? You into doing wax stuff? What about literally a jar full of distilling Easter eggs? Super comfy hoodies? I'll stop being silly and cut to the chase. Thank you for sponsoring this video into the AM. In case you don't know, super comfy shirts, really cool art. They do other things like hoodies and actually their boxes are insanely good. And the best thing is this weekend, 20% off store wide. Use the code in the description down below or right here and you get another 10% off. Our first order of business is to deal to our corn. So grab your duty great big pot, half fill it with water and get it boiling. Then we're gonna keep adding in corn, nice and slowly, add a little bit of corn, give it a stir, but only fill it up to about a little bit over two thirds full. That's important guys, we're gonna keep needing to add stuff to this, so don't overfill your pots. And once again, if you've got corn left over, that's fine. Use a second pot or do this in batches. Now, do you remember that half kilo of distiller's malt that we put aside? We're about to use it now. So sprinkle a couple of handfuls over the pot and give it a good stirring. The enzymes in the distiller's malt are gonna help stop this turning into just a thick gooey porridge. The enzymes in that malt are going to denature really quickly at the temperatures we're cooking at, so don't add it in all at once. Add a couple of handfuls every now and again throughout the next 45 minutes just to keep it thin. Keep stirring over medium heat until it gets up to a gentle simmer, uh, and this is gonna be a game of adding a little bit more distiller's malt every now and again, adding a little bit more water every now and again to stop it from getting too scarily thick. We want that corn to simmer for about 45 minutes. Now, about partway through that 45 minutes, grab a quick break from stirring, get your uh, distillation pot, and fill it with five liters of water. We want that boiling uh, when the corn is finished. Once the corn's simmered for 45 minutes and the water in the pot is boiling, kill the power to the pot, pop your brew in a bag bag into the pot and secure it around the top so it doesn't fall in, and add all of the corn mixture into the brew in a bag bag. You're gonna want a total volume of uh, water and corn mixture in this pot to reach 20 liters. That's gonna be kind of important in a little bit. Uh, pro tip, if you haven't done it already, it's not a horrible idea to measure out certain amounts of liquid into a, this kind of still, and then scratch on the inside with a nail or something, or a little uh, engraving tool to, to have measurement units on the side of your pot. I need to jump in real quick and say a huge thank you to the Patreons. Thank you team for supporting the channel day in and day out, and uh, everyone else say thank you to the Patreons too, because you guys were the ones that uh, kept asking for this video, so here we are. If you're enjoying these videos and you're finding value in them, Feel free to sign up on Patreon if you'd like to. If you don't like Patreon, I get it, I understand. You can uh, have a think about becoming a channel member right here on YouTube. All right, let's get back to it. Once the corn and the water have been combined, they're gonna be sitting at roughly like 85 to 95 degrees Celsius, and we're gonna let it sit and chill for a half hour or three to get down to 69 degrees Celsius. 69 degrees Celsius is the temperature where we wanna start adding all of the rest of the grain in on top. So add a little bit in, give it a good stirring. Add a little bit more, give it another good stirring. We don't wanna to put too much in at any one time and let it sit for too long because it will get stuck together and things aren't gonna be as efficient. Once all the grains have been mashed in, check the temperature and we're hoping for a temperature of 65 to 66 degrees Celsius. Now this recipe was specifically designed to leave a bit of headroom in the top of our pot. So if it is too hot, if it's above 60, like if it's at 67 degrees Celsius, put a little bit of cold water in. If it's below, put some boiling water in. Don't stress about it too much, guys. It's not the be all, end all. Uh, and please, please, add a little bit of water, give it a good stirring and check. Don't go just dumping a bunch of water in there because you might overshoot. Now it's time to insulate the pot up really well and forget about it for an hour and a half. 
If you want to, for bonus points, you can uh, pop the top at about 45 minutes, give it a really good stirring and close it all back up again. The upside is that it kind of agitates everything and just helps with efficiency in terms of making sure that the enzymes get in contact with everything everywhere. The downside is it's going to let out a whole lot of heat really, really quickly. So that's up to you. Honestly, uh, I'd take it or leave it either way. <laughs> Remember, at the beginning, I called this bourbon not bourbon. <laughs> That's because we're adding some stuff in here that regardless of where you make this stuff, you can't technically call it bourbon. White table sugar. That's our safety net. So regardless of what happens with the mash, this thing's going to ferment. Now you could, if you want, experiment with substituting out table sugar for brown sugar. It's entirely up to you if you want to try it, uh, but we're going to need 5.8 kilograms. Clean out the pot that you used for the corn, add in 5 litres of water, get it to a boil, add the sugar in, stir it until it is all dissolved, and add in a teaspoon or two of whatever acid you like, really. Um, citric, tartaric, lemon juice, they'll all work, uh, and we're going to boil this for 45 minutes. Bonus points if you want to boil it for even a little bit longer and start getting just a little bit of colour on that sugar. Next up, honey. Uh, and I am substituting sugar for honey because once again we're trying to crowbar in complexity and flavour from the beginning. So uh, I'm using a local wild honey that has some really cool dark kind of funky flavours for honey. It's got like lots of dark fruit in it and it has uh, dark caramel kind of flavours. Once again, flavours that I like to find, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes in a really well maturated bourbon. Once you're finished simmering the sugar, kill the heat and add in 250 grams of honey until it's dissolved and all of that mixture can go into the fermenter. Anyway, now it's time to get back to our mash. Once it's sat there for an hour and a half, it's time to strain the grain from the liquid. And I find the easiest way to do this is to sling a rope over something nice and tough uh, above you and just use that to hoist the grain bag up. Don't, however, hoist it all the way out of the pot yet. You'll make a giant mess. Trust me, ask me how I know. <laughs> Instead, let it drain for about 15 minutes before it goes above the pot, top of the pot uh, and then lift it up quickly in one fluid motion up well above so it can sit above the pot and drip down into the pot. Once it's dripped out for a little bit, you can uh, squeeze the bag if you want, or you can twist the bag to help squeeze it. All of those squeezings or drippings, whatever you want to call it, uh, is going over into our fermenter as well. Now you don't have to do this, but once again, bonus points if you want to, uh, we can sparge those grains. Obviously we're doing this in a really weird way for people that no all grain brewing, but here we go. That bag uh, goes back into the pot you were using or back into a different bucket. Top it up with some hot water, ideally at about 75 degrees Celsius. Let it sit and steep for a little while. Agitate it, move it around, stir it, and then do the same process again. Hoist the bag, let it drip, squeeze it, put that stuff into the fermenter. I did this twice and I think it was well worth it. Well worth doing it twice. After that, you're gonna get really diminishing returns. Once again, it's not 100% necessary if you don't want to do it. Now it's time to top our fermenter up to somewhere between 80 and 90 litres in total. That volume is somewhat flexible, but what you're really aiming for at this point is 25 degrees Celsius. That's the temperature we want for our yeast. Once you've got to that point, if you have the equipment, take a gravity reading with a hydrometer or a refractometer. A rough ballpark figure here is you want to be somewhere between 1.055 and 1.070. I don't personally think you're going to need to add any yeast nutrient into this. The grain is taking care of that ourselves. But what we do obviously need is yeast. Now this is up to you. You can use whatever yeast you like. I am going to use M1 by Angel because I think it adds some really cool esters up front in a young whiskey. I enjoy that, I like it. Uh, but I get that using certain kind of yeasts, you know, some places you can't get them. Um, buying other yeasts can get really expensive, especially on larger ferments like this, I understand. So if you wanna use baker's yeast, by all means go ahead and do so. Just understand that it will, it really does make a difference. It's not bad, it's just gonna be different. In any case, you're gonna need roughly 40 grams of yeast. Pitch that on in there if you can. Keep the temperature at a constant 25 degrees Celsius and let it do its thing. My ferment fermented out completely dry. Don't stress out if yours, if it finishes at 1.005 or something like that, it's, it's not an issue at all. Don't worry about it. Uh, mine took 
five days to ferment, and then I left it for another three days. I would suggest doing that if you can. It really can add some extra flavor. Now this recipe was specifically designed with the T500 in mind when it comes to volume. So it'll fit three pretty much perfect stripping runs into the T500. What that means is you fill the pot up with roughly 20 liters. You can probably squeeze a little bit more in there if you want to, uh, and you distill it in pot mode. We're not worrying about cuts. We're not worrying about taking four shots. None of that. We'll deal with that later. Run plenty of water through the condenser at the beginning after about 15 minutes. You can drop that back down a little bit to sort of a trickle. Um, ideally, you want the spirit to be coming out the spout at about 20 degrees Celsius and the water coming out of the condenser to be quite warm. Run all the way until the spirit coming off the end of the spout drops down to about 10%. Collect all of that stuff. That's called low wines. Then empty the still out. Fill it back up again from the fermenters and rinse and repeat. You're going to do this three times in total. The stuff that you've collected from those distillations is generally called low wines. Clean the pot out, put it back into the pot, and start distillation again. Now we're doing the spirit run. If you can, at this stage, I would highly recommend dropping the power going into the still. I ran mine at around about 60% power for this. If you're not able to do so, and you just have to run it at full noise, that's fine, don't worry about it, it's still gonna work. But I would suggest uh, getting the ability to control power is probably the first upgrade you wanna look at. In any case, 60% power. I like to distill with four or five glasses. I call this rolling cuts, and it just gives you the ability to go back in time, basically, and not be pressured to make cuts on the spot. Whole different topic. There's a video in the description down below if you want to check it out. The first order of business is to take our four shots. Now you're going to want to take around about 100 mils of this stuff. We're not going to use it. We're not going to reuse it. Uh, chuck it out or use it as fire lighter. That's what I do. Next up, we're going to collect the heads. And this is where things start to get a, a little bit artsy. Uh, and the reason being is that your process and your ferment is going to be slightly different to mine. So we are probably going to end up with different optimal cut points. I'm going to give you some pointers though. <laughs> so first of all, I would collect around about 400 mils off the still. And then once you get to that mark, start tasting what's coming off the still. If you're not used to tasting at high ABV, be very, very careful with this because you can blow your palate out instantly. You won't be able to taste anything for hours. Proof it down to 40% before you taste it. What you're looking for is the spirit to start subtly changing. It's going to start losing that fake floral cleaning product, uh, often like really weird fake apple, all of those sort of aromas are going to start disappearing, it's going to stop feeling so volatile in your mouth, and it's going to be less prickly on the side of your tongue. When that starts to happen, it's a pretty good indication that you're starting to head into hearts. But like I said, I am going to give you some numbers as guidelines. Definitely get to 400 mils, don't take less than that. I ended up cutting from heads to hearts at 650 mils. That is not a magic number. It's not a magic bullet by any means necessary. That's actually slightly less heads than I thought I was going to take. But on that run, it just, it just seemed to be right. If you want to, when you know you're into hearts, you can switch over to a larger vessel if you want, so you're not juggling the smaller jars. If you've only run the still a few times, it's not a horrible idea just to have a buttload of jars laid out, so you can just keep collecting and sort of sampling and not be rushing. It's time to kick back and let the still do its thing. At this point in time, uh, I will often bump the power up just a little bit and move from kind of a drip, drip, drip up to a drip, drip spurt, if that makes sense. And at this point in time, I do actually use the thermometer on the top of the still. Not to alter things, not to change how it's running, nothing like that. I use it simply to give me an indication of when I should start looking for tails to show up. So as soon as I hit 90 degrees Celsius, I know it's time for me to be on my game, especially uh, with a run like this, because we're hoping to age this a lot faster. If you want to age this for two or three years, then maybe you want to go a little deeper into the tails, but I'm going to cut this pretty clean. Once again, there's no magic bullet here. The best way to do it is with your senses, unless you're making exactly the same thing over and over and over again, then you can distill by the numbers. Uh, but for tails, there's going to be a very subtle but definite change between fun flavors and nasty flavors. Uh, the more grungy, grainy stuff is cool. That smell of like when you open up a bag of corn and stick your head in and smell it. That's nice, I think, in a whiskey. The darker chocolates and coffees and stuff like that can show up near the tails as well. But they're actually very close, when you think about it, to flavors like wet cardboard 
or maybe even like stinky wet dog in the car on the way home. You don't want that stuff. <laughs> so make sure you're on your game and watching things at this time of the run. Once again, this isn't a magic bullet. I decided to cut at 56% ABV coming off the spout. You can if you want, keep running the still all the way down to about 10% coming off the spout and collect all of those tails, combine them with the heads that we had before, call them faints and uh, save them up to use for your next run. Not necessary and it's not gonna affect this product at all. It's just gonna potentially make stuff in the future a little bit better uh, and give you a little bit more product in the future outside the scope of this video. But if you wanna save it to learn about it in the future, there's an option. Now it's time to proof your hearts down to maturation ABV or maturation proof. I am personally gonna do this at 55% ABV or 110 proof. Uh, if you want to follow along exactly, I would suggest you do the same. If you like a little bit more spice and pepper in your whiskey, you could go a little bit higher, maybe 60%, 120 proof. If you like a really smooth, mellow, easy bourbon, uh, maybe you want to go down closer to 50% ABV or 100 proof. If you're making bourbon, then you don't really have a choice. You're going to use virgin American white oak. <laughs> I strongly, strongly suggest that uh, you use seasoned oak. Six months out in the elements, at least ideally 18 months or more. This stuff that I've got has actually been seasoned for four years and I would suggest toasting this in your oven at 320 degrees Fahrenheit or 160 degrees Celsius for 45 minutes and then putting a light char on it. Once again, if you really like the sweeter side of things, maybe toast and char a little bit lighter. If you really like the more grungy, spicy, out there, almondy, sort of almost acrid flavors in bourbon, toast and char a little bit heavier. That's up to you, uh, that's up to you. But if you're just not sure, follow along with the recipe, it's gonna do you great. I know people use all sorts of other products for this. These are the things that I've found the absolute best results with. Much better than chips or the uh, spirals or anything like that. It just does a really, really good job. If you're wanting to age this really quickly, I would suggest using probably one of these staves per liter, maybe two liters of whiskey. You can split these sort of things really easy with an ax or something like that. It's not gonna be a problem. If you're wanting to age for three to six months, I'd suggest one of these for uh, two to three liters of whiskey. Or if you're wanting to age it for a decent amount of time, uh, one of these for like five to six liters of whiskey. Now, I am kind of in the mood to experiment with this and see what happens when you age it for a decent amount of time, even though I made it specifically for you guys to age relatively quickly. So I've put this into a Badmo barrel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Badmo barrels, for sending me this. Uh, I absolutely freaking love these things. I, I'm gonna do a video on these soon, but the, the general breakdown is that with a barrel like this, it's really hard to age it for ages because the, the, the ratio of wood to liquid is so high that you just have to get it out of the barrel relatively quickly. Uh, this, because it's wood on the front, metal around the outsides, it's kind of the best of both worlds. It's actually a barrel. There's actually breathing action going on through the wood, but you can, uh, you can age it for a long ass time. So that's my plan. Uh, but in addition to that, I also have this here, which I'm gonna age a lot faster. I'm gonna age uh, aim for three months for this one. And I did a wee sample where I uh, held it at 66 degrees Celsius with a piece of the exact wood, uh, treated in the exact way that I'm suggesting you guys do it. Uh, and I have a couple of samples here to taste. So this sample is at 43% ABV and this one is at uh, 55 still. So let me taste this. The first thing I note right off the bat is corn. Slightly caramelly and chocolatey, but with dark fruits like kind of um, plums, prunes, dates, maybe a little bit of fig, and almost none of that piercing, cutting, like sugar bowliness because it's all covered up with those sweet flavors that you don't normally get in a sugar head. I'll be real with you, at 55%, it's still a bit brash, <laughs> which is why uh, I proof this down to 43% uh, and I've let it sit for a couple of hours just to, to mellow out as well. You lose the nose, that's just what happens with lower proof whiskies. It's not as uh, in your face and bold in terms of flavors. But now the full 
flavor palette's coming out a little bit better because it's not so jaggy. I gotta tell you, I think I nailed the specialty malts and the honey in this. You can get little pieces of them and they contribute aged barrel-like flavors to the whiskey, but you kind of can't tell that it's honey in here. Does that make sense? I don't know. Anyway, I really hope you guys try this one. I think it's one of my best recipes I've ever made. If you do try it, make sure to come back and drop a comment here and let me know how you did. So, if you've enjoyed this video guys, please, please, please do all the youtube -y things and help me out. Like, comment, share, subscribe, so on and so forth. But more important than all of that, I'll see you next time. Keep on chasing the craft. See ya!